The scripture reading this morning will come from Hosea chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being priests for me, because you have forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your children. The more they increase, the more they sin against me. I will change their glory into shame. They eat up sin of my people. They set their heart on their iniquity, and it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. For they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall commit harlotry, but not increase, because they have ceased obeying the Lord. Harlotry, wine, and new wine enslave the heart. You may be seated. It has been an emotional week already. Um, I confess to our Bible class Wednesday night that I've been struggling, and um, I appreciate your prayers on my behalf, but as we come together today, our, our Bible class this morning and our home builders class, I believe, was a very productive, just a beautiful class, so much good discussion, and I'm, I'm gaining and growing from that class so much, and then to come in here and be part of be privileged to be part of such a sincere, em, emotional service to this point. Uh, Jonathan's comments, the partaking of the Lord's Supper, it, it's just an emotional day already. And, and this subject is not an easy subject to preach on. I know that it can be difficult. There is a lot of misunderstanding, and I want to try to clarify some things, but just know that it's already an emotional day and on top of that, I've been, it's weighed on my heart all week, the way I presented last week's sermon about the sanctity of marriage. I hope that no one was made to feel bad. I know that we have among us some who are in a divorced position and maybe even remarried, and, and I hope that no one was made to feel bad. I just hope that God's Word is presented truthfully and faithfully, but I do understand the emotion, especially that's connected with the idea of what the Bible says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, but I have good reason for wanting to present these messages. I think it's especially appropriate that Valentine's Day is coming up and our hearts do turn toward love and we're thinking about the ones that we love at this time, but I do have reasons. The elders actually suggested the idea that we preach on this topic and, and preach what God's Word says about it. But number one, I, I'm preaching on this for our children, for our young people. Last week's message and then this one to follow it up, our young people need to understand God's perspective on marriage. They're being bombarded with being asked to accept the idea of homosexual marriage and we cannot support that we cannot approve of it we cannot believe that it is okay it's not the bible tells us that homosexuality and homosexual marriage then would be an abomination of what his design for that relationship is our children need to understand god's perspective on marriage divorce and remarriage but then also for those who are in this position. For those who are in second marriages especially and may have questions, I want you to understand how difficult it might be to accept what the Bible says and what you need to do, but we've got to hear it. We've got to know it. Nothing is more important than our soul's salvation. I love you and I want you to go to heaven and that's why I want to present this message to you today. We need to understand our relationship with our spouse from God's perspective. I want you to know as we begin here that it is possible to be married to someone who is not your spouse. I hope that we understand that. It is possible to be in a marriage that God does not recognize. It's possible to be married to someone who is not your spouse. John chapter 4, Jesus deals with the woman at at the well. And she had had five husbands and Jesus told her the man that she now had was not her husband. She was married to someone that was not her spouse. We need to understand that that is possible. 
And I'm asking you to consider your relationship with your spouse this morning. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be emotional. But nothing is more important than your soul's salvation. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 19. I do believe that this is the most comprehensive passage on the topic. We're not going to be able to cover everything that the Bible says, but I will assure you that everything that the Bible says elsewhere about any of these ideas, marriage, divorce, or remarriage, will agree, it will harmonize with what we find here in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. This is the most comprehensive text on the matter. So let's read it first. And then we'll discuss this piece by piece. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Last week we examined the idea of the sanctity of marriage and how God joins us together. He bonds us. We are united in more than just physical ways, but we become one when we're married. And God hates divorce because marriage is a divine institution. He designed it and He brings us together. He bonds us. He hates it when we break that union. He despises it. It involves sin. Sin, Someone sins in breaking that bond. It's always the case. We need to remember those things as we enter into an examination here of Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. First of all, notice... The temptation. In verse 3, the Jews are coming to him to tempt him. They ask him this question thinking that they again have him in a situation that he can't answer, that he can't get out of. They're tempting him to choose one way or the other and again he frustrates their temptation. But they came to him for the purpose of tempting him. They ask, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for? The King James says every cause or any cause in the modern versions. That word is pos, P-A-S in the Greek, and it means any. It means, is it lawful for us to put away, to divorce our wives for any reason that we want to? Just at any whim, we get tired of her, she burned the bacon, whatever it is, we can put her away, right? Isn't that what Moses commanded? They're trying to get him to contradict really even what Moses says, but they have they are the ones with the misunderstanding as we're going to see here. They thought they had him in a pickle. What it points out to us here is that this was a controversial issue even in Jesus' time. We're admitting as much today that there are a lot of opinions on this matter. There, If you go to different churches, we know that people go to different churches trying to find one that will agree with what they already believe about their own marriages. But it's not a matter of our opinions. As we're going to see here, the Pharisees are misinterpreting Moses. They are the ones with the misunderstanding and Jesus corrects it. He says there is a proper understanding. There is a truth. There is a right and wrong about this issue. But even in Jesus' time, this was a difficult subject. That's why they come to him tempting him with a question about divorce. It is a difficult subject, but this goes back even further than Jesus' time to the time when the the law, the command was given. We'll talk about that in a moment. But realize first of all that the fact that they come to him with a temptation regarding this issue issue shows us that this is a difficult subject. But God, Jesus gives an answer. He's plain and clear and to the point. He doesn't 
ask a question in response, he gives them the truth of the matter and he answers their question completely. We don't have to go past verse 6 in order to get an answer to this question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause, for any reason that he wants to? Jesus' answer is, God hates divorce in a sense. He says God doesn't want anyone ever to get uh, divorced for any reason. We need to understand that from God's perspective. God never wants us to get divorced. He never commands anyone to get divorced. Jesus answers the question very clearly. What God hath joined together, let not man ever, never get divorced. Let not man put asunder. Jesus does not struggle with the temptation. He doesn't balk at their question. They try to tempt him, but he isn't tempted. They're testing him. Jesus' answer is, it is never God's desire that you put away your wife for any reason. We have evidence and illustration of this in our scripture reading. The prophet Hosea. He was a faithful man, preached to the nation of Israel, asked them to repent of their sin, told them that there was a silver lining, that God still loved them and would never give up on them. And that's the whole point. Hosea was commanded by God as a prophet to go and take a wife from among the prostitutes. And when they were married, she continued cheating on him in today's terminology. She continued to be unfaithful to him. She was committing fornication or adultery against Hosea, her husband. But God would not permit him to put her away. God would not permit Hosea to give up on Gomer. And that illustrated God's love for his people. Young people, you need to understand, God never gives up on you. And what he wants us to understand about our spouse is that we should never want to give up on them. It doesn't matter whether they are abusing us or if they've abandoned us or if they're committing adultery against us. He never wants us to give up on them. He still loves us. No matter what sin we commit against Him, He never gives up on us. Let us have that same love for our spouse. To want to never give up. I understand how difficult this is. I understand how emotional this is. But Jesus' answer to their question is, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Have the, have the determination now, young people, that when you get married, you will never give up on your spouse. Jesus' answer here is, please have it in your hearts and minds. They are already misunderstanding the whole issue. They're already misinterpreting Moses. But have it in your hearts and minds that you're never going to get divorced. Their response then is, their reaction is, they think they have further tempted him. They think they've got him right where they wanted him. And maybe we misunderstand this question sometimes. But their response, their reaction then is, Now we've got you. Why then did Moses command? It's important that you understand that they use the word command, but Jesus uses the word suffer or permit. They say, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? The word command that they use is the word entelemi, and it means to enjoin. seems that their understanding of Moses' command regarding a divorce to which they're referring here, it seems that their understanding is that Moses was encouraging people to get divorced. That may have been part of the whole issue during this time. That they believed and were preaching that Moses says he didn't care. Marriage is not that important. Moses said you can get divorced for whatever reason you want to. It seems that they believed that Moses was teaching that marriage is disposable much like we see in our world today. But Jesus says that isn't at all the purpose or the reason why Moses gave you this permission, why he suffered you to put away your wives. 
You have to understand, this was a practice that was already going on. Before Moses ever received the Ten Commandments from God, they had already begun this practice of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. They never came to Moses and said, okay, you've received this law from God. We know it seems like there's been a lot of divorce among us. Are we doing this right, Moses? Can you tell us what's the right and wrong way to marry, divorce, and remarry? They never did that. The Israelites did not come to Moses on Mount Sinai at the time he received the law and ask them any, ask him any questions about this. And so this teaching, this permission, as they refer to it, a command, had been misinterpreted down through the centuries. The Pharisees here say, okay, so you're saying that Moses was wrong. When they ask the question, that's what they're accusing. That's where the temptation lies. They're saying, no, you're saying then that Moses was wrong. He gave us a command. He enjoined us to divorce our wives. Jesus says, you totally misunderstand what was going on. You've totally misinterpreted Moses. We need to see marriage from God's perspective. He says, Moses permitted you to do so. He suffered you to do so because of the hardness of your hearts. Your hearts, their hearts, our father's hearts were already hardened regarding this controversial issue. You couldn't have understood the truth at the time. And that's why he gave you this permission. He suffered you to do so, but from the beginning it was not so. And now he's going to give them the proper instruction. He's going to get them. He's going to inform them of God's view of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. He's already answered the first question back in verses 5 and 6. This is a separate matter, it seems. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? No, don't ever get divorced. If it can be avoided, avoid it at every cause. Never give up on your your spouse, but there is an exception. Why did Moses give a commandment? He permitted it because of the hardness of your hearts, but from God's perspective. He never wanted it to be so. From the beginning, it was not so. And so in verses 8 and 9, we need to understand that Jesus' purpose in what he says here is to get us to understand something about remarriage after divorce has occurred. In the middle of this, there is an exception delineated. But the purpose of what he says in verses 8 and 9 is not to present that exception. That's kind of a side note. The purpose of verses 8 and 9 is for these Pharisees and for us today to understand that remarriage results in further sin unless that divorce occurred because of fornication. We've lost sight of this in our culture today. That remarriage results in continually. That's why the ETH in the King James is on the end of the word committeth. In verse 9, remarriage results in continually committing adultery. How many people, our friends and neighbors, are living in sinful, adulterous relationships because their first marriage did not end as a result of fornication? And maybe even some of us here today. There's only one exception to this rule. We need to get it back in our hearts and our minds that remarriage after a divorce results in fornication. That's the general rule. There is one exception. But in general, remarriage results in an adulterous relationship. It results in continually committing sin. I'm concerned about your soul. Jesus was concerned about their souls. It's not about our physical pleasure. It's not about our desire to satisfy the lusts of the flesh. It's about our relationship with God, whether we have access to Him. We must see marriage, divorce, and remarriage from God's perspective. From the beginning, it was not so. Remarriage, except in cases of fornication, results in further sin. The exception is if that divorce occurs because of fornication. Then, he says, the innocent party may remarry, but the one who committed the adultery cannot get married again. It cannot happen. Paul even tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8-11, through 11, if a person is unmarried, whatever the divorce, whatever caused the divorce, no matter how it happened, you have two choices. You either remain single or you return to your spouse. Jesus here, uh, that's the general rule. He gives us an exception. If the divorce occurred because of fornication, the innocent party may remarry. When they remarry, they are not constantly or continuously 
committing adultery. Let's define these terms real, real quickly here. Fornication and adultery. Fornication is sex between two people who are not married. It's a broader, more general term than adultery. Fornication can be between two single people. Fornication can be between a single person and a married person. Adultery is when you have sex with someone who is not your spouse. You are married. And you have sex with another person that is not who you married. And so adultery is more specific than fornication. The exception to the rule here is when your spouse commits fornication. They have sex with someone besides you. They have sex with someone that is not their spouse. Then if you are divorced and are innocent of fornication, adultery in that case, you may remarry. But any other remarriage results in sin. That's Jesus' point in verses 8 and 9. It's something of which we need to be reminded. The question we have to ask then is, what do we do? What do we do about this? What if we are in this situation? What am I supposed to do? It's not easy to hear. But again, 1 Corinthians 7 gives us the two options. If we're divorced from our first spouse, and it was for any reason other than fornication, we have two options, remain single or return to that of first spouse. If that can't happen, if, if we cannot return to that spouse, we have to be content to remain single. What does that mean if we've remarried after a first marriage dissolved for any reason other than fornication? It means that we are in the situation that the people in Ezra's time were in. Let's go back to Ezra chapter 10. Ezra, of course, is a prophet of God. He leads the people back in one of the returns from captivity, but they realize in chapter 10 that they had married people that they were not permitted to marry. They realize that their men had taken wives from these other nations, and God never approved of that. Whenever God's people turned away from Him, it was always attributed to their marriages and to their idolatry. That's a consistent theme throughout the Old Testament. Their marriages to these foreign women and their idolatry, and the two go hand in hand. You really can't have one without the other. One causes the other in many cases, it seems. But here in Ezra chapters 9 and 10, they had taken wives from these foreign nations, and they had to put them away. I want you to begin reading with me in Ezra 10. Verse 9, notice in verse 2 of chapter 10, they say at the end of that verse, yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. They were pouring their hearts out. They wanted to be right with God more than anything else. They had a relationship that satisfied them physically. They had put away their wives for any cause, but now they recognized that their marriages were sinful. They were constantly and continuously committing sin by being in these marriages. But there was hope in Israel concerning this thing. So beginning in chapter 10, verse 9, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month, on the twentieth day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do His pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. What do you do? What would you do? If you're in this position this morning, what are you going to do? Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. But the people are many, and it is a time of much rain, and we are not able to stand without, neither is this a work of one day or two. For we are many that have transgressed in this thing. Let now our rulers of all the congregation stand, and let all them which have taken strange wives in our cities come at appointed times, and with them the elders of every city and the judges thereof until the fierce wrath of our God for this matter be turned from us. What are you going to do? You have to make it right. Your relationship with God is more important 
than your physical satisfaction. I have heard of couples who have been married 35 and 40 years who were in an adulterous relationship because their first marriages did not dissolve as a result of fornication, but never knew the truth about the matter. And when they learned the truth, when they were taught what God's Word says, what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, they humbled themselves. And they put away their spouse that they'd been married to for 40 years. Because they wanted to be right with God. In one case that I know of, they had they shared a home. Of course, they had a house together. They had been married that long. They still loved each other. They didn't stop loving each other. They didn't forget about the time they had spent together. But they built another house on the same property and they both had separate houses. They remained friends. They were best friends. They couldn't just ignore the time they had spent together. But they were no longer married. I know this is difficult. I know this is emotional. But our relationship with God comes first. There is a teaching today that doesn't matter what your marital status is, if you believe the truth, if you respond to the gospel, if you obey God's commands to be baptized, it washes all that away and you're forgiven of all that. But that ETH, that idea in Matthew chapter 19 that we continuously commit sin is important. Baptism doesn't just wash away the fact that we are continuously committing adultery if we're in a marriage like this. The people in Ezra's day had to put their wives away. I'm sorry to have to put it to you this way, but think about your eternal home. This morning, if you need to obey the gospel, we want you to do that. Believe in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, and be baptized in His name to have those sins washed away. If you've done that, you recognize you have sin, especially if this morning you recognize your relationship is causing you to continuously commit adultery. (coughs) Repent. This is not a work of one day or two. I know it is not easy, but you have to do what's right. We encourage you, if you have a need, respond by coming forward as we stand and sing.